Thank you, Regina, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, The New Tosca and Its Implications. I'm Ed Rakowski, Editor-in-Chief of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all listeners for attending today's event, and especially Dassault Systems Biovia for sponsoring this webinar. Dassault Systems Biovia provides a scientific collaborative environment for advanced biological, chemical, and materials experiences. Sophisticated enterprise solutions from Biovia support collaborative science, unified laboratory management, process production operations, and quality regulatory management, driving innovation for science and process-based industries. We have two presenters today. Michael Doyle has a PhD in natural sciences from Cambridge in the UK. He is the principal scientist and senior director at the SO Systems Biovia, where he is responsible for technical direction. He previously worked at ICI Agrochemicals, BP Chemicals, MSI, and Accelerus. Our second presenter is Mark Duval, a principal in the Washington, D.C. office of the environmental law firm Beverage and Diamond. He is recognized as one of the leading practitioners concerning the Toxic Substances Control Act. His practice also includes work with EPA under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Redenticide Act, as well as product-related work involving the Consumer Product Safety Act, the Food and Drug Administration, the Federal Trade Commission, and other agencies. In addition, he leads the Beverage and Diamond OSHA practice. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Michael. Thank you very much, Ed. Welcome, everybody. I thought before um, we get into Mark and the really important details, we'd set a little bit of the scene of why the Tosca and chemical innovation matters and why it matters to DASA Systems and Biovia. The mission of Biovia is about driving scientific innovation. We drive innovation in areas that range from understanding and designing semiconductors in the devices that you may be listening to this webcast on, the computer screens you use every day, it may be even in your car, the automotive batteries that drive a number of the new sustainable systems that people are using for trucks and transportation, and maybe now coming into aircraft, the whole design of modern plastic or composite aeroplane systems, and the energy management and energy production. All of these areas involve chemical innovation. Even more so, chemical innovation drives to the heart of precision medicine and the life sciences where molecules and the design of new chemistries and new substances affect human health and the human condition, and in the area of consumer goods where they can affect health through cleanliness, through washing, and through water treatment and wastewater. So on the next slide, the company and the organization I work with is involved with science and innovation. This is a long-term view. This is something we have done for many years in many different aspects of materials and designing products. We do this with a lot of partners that help us collaborate and interact. And in doing so, we understand and work with them around the science and new materials and the formula and the characteristics of those formula. Next slide. Build it down, one more. So these systems are involved with the idea of a scientific product life cycle so that innovation through to development and registration and regulation and production all in different areas involve the same main part, one more click please, which builds down to uh, collaborative science, technical development, laboratory testing, registration, production, simulation, and management. All of these elements fit into a scientific life cycle that supports product identity and product management. Next slide. So as people move into this digital world of designing new products and understanding their implication and making sure that those products are safe, we see a transition. We see changes 
from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. We see people moving from tests that are part of the integral design of a product to modeling and understanding the risk and building scientific models that represent the risk and the supply and the performance and the environmental impact of those products. We see people moving from historically out-of-date information to managing information currently that enables them to meter and manage systems. And we see people going from uh, retroactive fixing on breakdowns and inspections to receiving predictive capabilities on those systems. Next slide. We see the use of data and big data as enabling more intelligent and smarter systems in the decision processes and using that to understand performance. How does this relate to the TSCA? Next slide, please. Well, if you look at a number and a series of corporations, next, you will see that their value, the value of the business, is both related to the current money, cash on hand, and how they work, but is also, for example, in the consumer goods domain, governed by a future expected growth. And in that future, there are a number of risks or areas that these companies need to look up and be careful. Obviously, there are issues around water. There are issues around labor violations or labor actions. There are issues around emissions. But also, a very significant issue about that is understanding chemical safety, quality, and legal elements. And so, if you look at these organizations, they pay a lot of attention. And a lot of our customers ask us questions about how do we manage chemical safety? We have tracked information through all of our product lifecycle, but how do we manage it? What are the implications? How does the Tosca leverage that information? And that is what we're here to understand from Mark. How do these systems work? How does the registration and regulation affect and interact with all of the information and the data that is now no longer hidden in bulk, but can be surfaced in a modern digital enterprise? Last slide, please. So again, Biovia is part of DASO Systems. We have done this for 20 years, providing chemical and scientific knowledge management. I now like and respectfully hand over to Mark to explain how the Tosca impacts and connects to that. Mark? Well, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking uh, about the uh, changes that have been made to the Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, which are now uh, working on a year old. Uh, so we're also going to talk about what's been happening uh, since then, how EPA has been implementing the changes. Then we're going to pause and think about what this means to companies and how they can best protect themselves and take advantage of what's going on at EPA under TSCA. And then conclude with a few comments about how the uh, new American chemicals management regime differs from REACH in, as it does in significant ways. Next slide. Uh, the changes that recently happened are best viewed uh, with the perspective of history. Uh, the original Toxic Substances Control Act was um, adopted in 1976, or 40 years ago. Uh, it was cranking along until 1991 when a court decision threw out uh, EPA's uh, rule banning asbestos under Section 6 of TSCA. And EPA has not used Section 6 for the last 25 years as a result of that uh, opinion. Uh, the uh, TSCA reform legislation activities that went on for seven or eight years were in large part driven to fix Section 6 in response to that court decision. 
And while they were at it, Congress was going to also address other issues. Next slide. So we are now working with uh, a revised TSCA. Uh, it took effect in June 22nd, uh, 2016. Uh, so let's talk about what those changes are. Next slide. The uh, old statute was based on unreasonable risk. The new statute is based on unreasonable risk, but with a change. Unreasonable risk used to mean a balancing of costs and benefits. The new standard is focused solely on impacts to health or the environment without consideration of cost. Cost obviously is important, but that only comes in at the remedy stage, at the uh, risk management stage. Uh, the testing provision of TSCA had been weak because it would take three or more years for EPA to promulgate test rules. EPA now has authority to issue an order requiring companies to test. And the expectation is that that's the way EPA is going to proceed from now on. The new chemicals section, section five, uh, had some significant changes, uh, notably the requirement that EPA articulate an explanation when it decides not to take action, but there's also some changes to the applicable uh, terms that have resulted in uh, a different approach by EPA in addressing new chemicals under TSCA. Next slide. Uh, so under the revised approach, uh, a company submits a, uh, a pre-manufactured notice for a new chemical or a significant new use notice for a SNR chemical, so chemical subject to a significant new use rule. And EPA then makes a determination. If EPA determines that the chemical presents an unreasonable risk, then it proceeds to a rule restricting that substance. That rarely happens. More likely, EPA would make a determination that the chemical may present an unreasonable risk, in which case it would issue an order uh, restricting the substance, uh, ostensibly pending further information. That further information may never come, so that order may become uh, the final uh, rule. And EPA is, EPA used to make a pre may present finding in about 10% of the cases. It's now making a may present finding in approximately 75 or 80 percent of the cases. So that's a big change. And then finally, EPA may make a not likely to present unreasonable risk determination. Uh, that's new. Previously, EPA effectively made that determination, but it didn't have to explain it. Now it has to explain it. Uh, once it does explain it, uh, EPA allows companies to uh, proceed to market. EPA has keeping a uh, has a website explaining uh, its decisions not to uh, regulate, um, and but there's only about 35 chemicals that are on that list since June 22nd, and that's many months with only 35 or so chemicals found not likely to present an unreasonable risk. Next slide. Section six is the. Uh, where the most significant changes happened. Uh, the, uh, it now has three key functions. The first is a prioritization step, where EPA decides which chemicals it's going to focus on. Then there's a risk evaluation step, where EPA uh, evaluates uh, chemicals under a time deadline of three years, extendable to three and a half. And if it makes a determination that the chemical is likely, uh, presents an unreasonable risk, uh, then it proceeds directly to risk management, issuing a rule within two years uh, restricting that chemical. Section six now has detailed criteria uh, for which chemicals to select for consideration and how to conduct risk evaluations. Uh, it has quotas on how many chemicals uh, must be passing through the system at one time, and it has deadlines for when EPA must complete its action. These changes uh, have made, changed EPA from a, uh, an agency enforcing a statute with no particular mission and no particular driver to accomplish much of anything into a, uh, an agency with a clear mission and lots of drivers pushing it ahead um, 
uh, and continuing to push it ahead as the years go by. Um, so it's very much an action-forcing statute now in contrast to the way it was before. Uh, and there are, uh, uh, there are a couple of exceptions to the uh, three-step process, a certain persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals get some special treatment to get an abbreviated approach, which we'll talk about a little bit. Next slide. Uh, basically, just to be clear, EPA designates a chemical as high priority, then it uh, conducts a risk evaluation, makes a decision either to regulate or not to regulate. If it decides to regulate, then it promulgates a rule. Uh, in addition, a manufacturer can request a risk evaluation and EPA can decide whether or not to grant that request. Uh, that request comes with a price tag. The manufacturer has to pay either half or 100% of the cost, which is currently estimated at about $3.6 million. Uh, there's also a provision requiring 10 chemicals to be drawn from the 2014 Tosca Work Plan list of chemicals within six months of enactment, and that has happened. Next slide. Some other major changes uh, in Section 8, which has to do with record keeping and reporting, uh, there's a new requirement for inventory reset where every manufacturer uh, must and every processor may report chemicals that they manufactured or processed in the 10 years prior to enactment so that EPA can build an inventory of active substances, uh, a subset of everything that's on the inventory. And thereafter, once EPA has an active substances list, it will focus its prioritization uh, and risk evaluation activities on the active substances. Section 14, confidentiality, has been overhauled extensively. Uh, there's now substantiation requirements that are more detailed and onerous than they were before, and confidentiality claims have a 10-year life they expire after 10 years unless they're renewed. And that imposes new obligations on companies that submit confidential information and make CBI claims, to keep track of their claims, and to renew them if, they, uh, if the information should be kept confidential after 10 years. A lot of uh, uh, discussion went into the preemption provision. It was the most controversial part of Tosca reform. Uh, the bottom line, in my view, preemption is limited under this statute uh, and is not the most important aspect of it by far. Uh, for the most part, states can do what they want to do uh, with some exceptions, but only when EPA takes a preemptive action. Uh, Section 26, administrative, uh, adds a fee provision. EPA can now uh, charge substantial fees for a variety of activities and a lot of manufacturers and processors are going to be facing those fees, uh, much more than the $2,500 PMN fee that exists now. Uh, EPA has to go through notice and comment rulemaking to set the fees. Uh, we should expect to see a proposed rule on that in May or June. Uh, and there are also new science standards in Section 26. EPA must uh, uh, act based on the best available science and based on the weight of the scientific evidence. Uh, good concepts before, now legally mandated. Next slide. So let's talk about EPA's implementation of TSCA uh, as amended. Next slide. So the statute was immediately effective back on June 22nd when President Obama signed it, which meant that the new unreasonable risk standard kicked in and the new PMN uh, provisions Section 5 kicked in. EPA reset the review period for all PMNs that were then pending on the basis that EPA, that Congress clearly intended that they do so because they needed adequate time to evaluate all chemicals under the um, new criteria. Many of the chemicals that were reset back in June have still not completed the PMN review process, even though uh, a number of them were simply waiting out that had been dropped from further review and were waiting uh, to run out their 90-day clock. The new science provisions kicked in and the confidentiality provisions kicked in. In the first three months, EPA provided some guidance, some FAQs, held some public meetings, and uh, started implementing the PMN uh, 
review, the revised PMN review process, we have seen that result in a substantial backlog. Um, there have been a public, there's been a public meeting uh, about that. There's been a public uh, comment period about that. And we've seen uh, EPA budget statements saying one of the uh, key uh, goals for the TSCA program under the Trump administration is to work that backlog down. So there's hope that it'll uh, improve, but I don't think it's going to go back to the system that it was there uh, before uh, enactment. Next slide. So back in December, six months after December, January, uh, approximately six months after enactment, uh, EPA published a list of the first 10 chemicals to receive risk evaluations. Uh, those chemicals are 1,4-dioxane, bromopropane, asbestos, carbon tetrachloride, uh, a cluster of flame retardants called the cyclic aliphatic bromide cluster, methylene chloride and methyl pyrrolidone, uh, pigment violet 29, uh, tetrachloroethylene and trichloroethylene. So EPA is um, uh, identified those as the first ones to receive risk evaluations. Uh, it um, and it's working away on those. It also published proposed framework rules for the prioritization process and the risk evaluation process and for the inventory reset. Um, all of those are going to be tremendously important. The final rules are due uh, this June. In addition, uh, EPA issued the first proposed rules under Section 6, risk, uh, first risk management rules under Section 6, since um, uh, the asbestos decision in 1990 uh, for methylene chloride and uh, and methyl pyrrolidone and also for trichloroethylene. Next slide. So we're coming up on the one-year anniversary in June, so two months from now. Uh, by that time, EPA is required to have published the scope uh, uh, of the, for which it is going to conduct the risk evaluations for the first 10 chemicals. It took comments on that. And it's required to have final rules on the prioritization process, risk evaluation process, and inventory reset. Uh, those rules, uh, as proposed rules, received a lot of comments. EPA made a lot of policy decisions in the proposed rules that um, some people were not happy with. It'll be uh, uh, the EPA's final judgments, as reflected in the final rules, will impact the process for many years to come. So. Uh, those are going to be very important to pay attention to. Um, on the inventory reset in particular, there's going to be a reporting requirement coming up where, um, uh, as I mentioned, manufacturers must and then processors may uh, report chemicals. Uh, once the active substances list is built, then it will be illegal to manufacture or process a chemical on the inactive substances list. Uh, i.e. not on the active substances list, um, without first notifying EPA that an inactive substance should be transferred to the active substances list. So even though the chemical's on the inventory, that's not enough uh, if it's uh, not on the active substances list. So there's an extra administrative step that will be required to um, uh, be able to make sure that you're legal under TSCA. Uh, that isn't the case yet, but it's coming. Next slide. In December of this year, uh, manufacturers have to report, um, and after which time EPA will come up with an interim active substances list. Processors will have another six months after that to report to, uh, so that EPA can prepare the final active substances list. EPA also has to propose some rules on CBI substantiation. Uh, it's likely, uh, well, it's hoping, <laughs> I'm not sure likely is the right word, hoping to come up with final rules on those first three chemicals. And two years after enactment, so next June, uh, the processors have their reports due, um, a final rule on CBI substantiation. EPA has a deadline for developing any policies or guidance under the law. It also has to publish a proposed rule for review of any confidential chemicals on the active substances list, trying to get them off the confidential inventory if uh, they're no longer truly confidential. And it has to come out with guidance on generic names. Next slide. 
So it continues. Um, by December 2018, um, final rules are due for uh, review of confidential chemicals on active substances list, and then uh, more rules uh, on uh, the persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals. Those have been identified already, um, the five that are going to have a proposed rule by June 2019. They are deca uh, bromo diphenyl ether, which is a flame retardant, hexachlorobutadiene, which is another flame retardant, pentachlorothiophenol, which is an agent used to make rubber more pliable, uh, a flame retardant, tris isopropyl phenyl phosphate, and a fuel and lubricant additive, 246-tris terbutyl phenol. So those are going to be regulated in proposed rules due at um, the end of uh, due mid-2019. And it continues. Uh, by 20, December 2019, EPA has to have not 10, but 20 risk evaluations ongoing. Um, and as soon as it finishes one risk evaluation, it has to pick another chemical to, so it keeps uh, at least 20 going uh, at one time. And there's also a requirement to notify, to, to identify 20 low priority chemicals by that date. Next slide. And et cetera. Uh, it just keeps on going. This is an action forcing statute. EPA is very busy. It has very little discretion about time deadlines. It knows it, that NGOs, if no one else, is likely to sue it if it misses its statutory deadlines. And EPA is doing its best to meet those deadlines. It's already started to slip in a couple of cases. Um, but uh, we now can expect a future of a very active uh, TSCA uh, implementation program uh, that drives towards uh, reviewing, uh, assessing, and regulating chemicals uh, uh, in ways that we have not seen in the past. Next slide. So let's talk about what this means to you. What should you be doing uh, in light of this uh, radically different regulatory structure? Next slide. Uh, let's start with the Trump factor. So there's obviously a new uh, sheriff in town. Uh, what does that mean for Tosca? We've been hearing how EPA uh, is going to lose 25% of its budget. It's going to lose uh, or more. Uh, it's going to lose 25% of its people or more. Uh, what does that mean to the Tosca program? Well, ironically, Tosca seems to be the one area of EPA that both the administration and the EPA administrator seem to think um, uh, are good ideas and we should push forward with. Uh, in Scott Pruitt, the EPA administrator in his confirmation hearings uh, said repeatedly that he supported TSCA implementation. Uh, I think a major factor is that the statute uh, amending TSCA passed just last year virtually unanimously in both houses of Congress. Uh, including with a lot of conservative Republican support. Um, the EPA budget, um, which cuts most uh, uh, EPA programs, actually calls for a modest increase uh, in the TSCA budget. Uh, why? Because EPA clearly has new obligations and it's going to need new resources. Uh, there is a push by the administration to get that fee rule out so EPA can start collecting fees. Um, and uh, I know the staff is working hard on that. Next slide. So uh, for the new chemicals area, uh, we're faced with much greater scrutiny than we had before. And that puts a premium on companies who do file new uh, uh, pre-manufacturer notifications to provide more data than they did before. There really is no minimum data set uh, you can provide as little, uh, you must submit all the data that you have on the chemical, but you don't have to have much data. Um, but you're much more likely to uh, avoid the detailed scrutiny or survive the detailed scrutiny if you do provide data. And so uh, you may want to plan more testing ahead of time rather than waiting for EPA to use its models to suggest problems that may not be real. 
There's also uh, a complicating factor. Uh, the Section 5E, which has to do with the consent orders regulate restricting chemicals, requires EPA to consider the conditions of use. That term is defined in the statute to mean the circumstances as determined by the administrator in which a chemical substance is intended, known, or reasonably foreseen to be manufactured, processed, or distributed in commerce, uh, used, or disposed of. So reasonably foreseen, EPA interprets that as applying not just to activities that are reasonably foreseen by the PMN submitter, but by anybody, um, uh, competitors of uh, 10 years in the future. So they're really trying to address in the PMN stage issues that might better be addressed through a significant new use rule at a later stage. And that is really slowing down the process. Uh, we have seen that EPA has issued more than 500 action letters, uh, meaning for more than 500 PMNs, uh, EPA has notified PMN submitters that they can expect a 5E order. Uh, that is a greatly increased um, uh, pace compared to previously. And what it means is that the PMN review process is slowed down and it's more intensive and it's more likely to be restricted in the future and companies need to plan accordingly. Next slide. Uh, prior to enactment, significant new use rules were a big tool. There's more than 2,800 chemicals regulated uh, by significant new use rules. And while they are technically just a paperwork uh, requirement, you must submit a significant new use notice in the same form as the PMN notice uh, prior to engaging in a significant new use for a significant new use rule chemical. In practice, uh, almost nobody submits significant new use notices. They're only, EPA only expects to receive six a year uh, for 2,800 chemicals. Uh, so effectively, uh, SNRs act as restrictions. Companies either work hard to avoid that using that chemical at all, or they, if they must use that chemical, they work to avoid engaging in the significant new use identified in the rule. And the uh, significant new uses are a wide variety of things. Uh, the point here is that SNRs were an important tool before. They're going to continue to be an important tool, particularly for um, new chemicals after they have um, been allowed to uh, reach the market. Next slide. So section six, that's where uh, the biggest impacts are going to be. Uh, the critical decision that EPA has to make is which chemicals to work on. There's going to be more than 20,000 chemicals on the active substances list, that's my guess. Uh, EPA has to be working actively on at least 20 of them. Well, obviously, uh, that's one in a thousand um, of the candidates. And it's going to be um, critical that companies do what they can either to make sure that EPA stays away from their chemical for a comfortably long time or uh, turns its attention to it early if that um, is what would work out better. Um, so. I would suggest that companies get prepared, do the strategic analysis, identify your, the important chemicals to your uh, company, uh, and then see where they stand in the likelihood that EPA will turn to them. The um, uh, best source of guidance as to where EPA is going to turn is the 2014 Tosca Work Plan Update List, which is on the EPA website. There's 90 chemicals and categories. EPA is going to go beyond those 90, but EPA is required to use up all those 90 in the uh, sooner rather than later. So that's the best source. If your chemical's on there, then that's a good indication that you're uh, within EPA's targets. But also look at what's going on in Europe and in Canada, because they have their own chemicals management programs. Uh, there's no necessary connection between their activities and EPA's, but EPA talks to them regularly and it pays attention to what's going on. So they can influence EPA's choices. Uh, I think it makes sense for companies with respect to their important chemicals to assess the databases. Uh, how robust is the database? Will EPA be able to make a decision 
um, uh, if it decides to uh, evaluate them? Uh, are there some key data gaps? Uh, and then consider filling those gaps uh, or uh, anticipate that EPA will require you to fill those gaps through a test order. Uh, you also need to monitor EPA's interest in your chemicals and consider pushing information at EPA. Next slide. The risk evaluation stage, once EPA has prioritized a chemical of interest to your company, uh, gives you a number of opportunities to try and influence EPA. Obviously, uh, you want to submit comments. Uh, you can submit comments on the uh, draft final risk evaluation. That's fine, but it's pretty late. Uh, and your comments are unlikely to have much of an impact. Better to comment at the beginning, uh, for instance, on what the scope of the risk evaluation will be. Uh, and during, uh, bef uh, as soon as the chemical is prioritized or even considered for prioritization, consider uh, uh, steps to make sure the EPA has all the data it needs to make a good decision uh, from your perspective by submitting the data that uh, is not already in EPA's hands. Um, and early is better than late for submitting data so EPA can adequately uh, consider it. And since EPA does uh, focus on particular conditions of use, even though ostensibly it's going to look at all conditions of use, you might consider uh, ways in which your conditions of use uh, differ from those which might have greater concern. For instance, industrial use versus consumer use. Next slide. Uh, once EPA identifies a chemical as presenting an unreasonable risk, it then proceeds to risk management. There are more opportunities for comment. I would suggest commenting early. You don't even have to wait for a proposed rule to come out. It's probably better to get comments in before the proposed rule is even published. Uh, this is the stage where costs and benefits and alternatives uh, are very relevant. And that's the kind of information that you want to make sure EPA has adequate information about and that it considers. Uh, so again, advocacy. Next slide. Uh, briefly, uh, confidentiality claims, they're now harder to make, uh, and so you're going to have to think about your substantiation. Boilerplate language is much less likely to be successful than it was in the past. And in particular, uh, you need to recognize that there's going to be clues about the identity. You're going to have to divulge a structurally descriptive generic name. EPA is going to give out fairly rigorous guidance on that. Um, and EPA is going to review every single claim of confidentiality for chemical identities. So uh, be prepared. Next slide. So that's the new TSCA. How does it compare with REACH? Next slide. Well, it's very different, particularly from a risk management stage. Uh, for the registration purposes, uh, REACH applies to all chemicals. Uh, except polymers that are uh, manufactured in or imported into the EU in quantities one ton per year or greater. Well, uh, as we see uh, under TSCA, all new chemicals um, that are proposed for commercialization uh, are affected, but only active substances once prioritized are really within uh, EPA's focus. And that's probably going to be about 20 chemicals at a time. So much different scope. Under REACH, there are three bands uh, of submissions. We're coming up on the third band uh, by May 31st of next year. Uh, the third band, the one ton or greater uh, band is uh, going to be hitting. Uh, whereas TSCA, uh, you just pretty much Wait for EPA to make a decision about prioritization. Uh, the data requirements are radically different. Uh, REACH requires a full upfront dossier, whereas uh, under TSCA there are essentially no data requirements unless you're ordered to test, uh, but you will probably have a lot of in incentive to um, submit data. Next slide. Uh, the process is different under REACH. There's a uh, substance information exchange form, a consortium of, uh, uh, of companies that manufacture uh, or otherwise handle a chemical. Uh, 
and they submit a group dossier supplemented by company-specific information. Uh, under TSCA, that simply doesn't exist. Um, you can get together for advocacy purposes and conceivably for testing there may be consortia formed, uh, but basically it's every company for itself. Uh, for evaluation, EPA does a completeness check and it does evaluate the dossiers submitted um, uh, for a handful of chemicals as indicated on the uh, Community Ruling Action Plan. Uh, but there's a limited number of chemicals there out of the uh, tens of thousands of chemicals for which dossiers are submitted. Um, uh, EPA evaluates chemicals through the risk evaluation process. It's got three years to do that, but only for those that have been prioritized. Uh, the precautionary principle is very much alive in, under REACH. Uh, it is not accepted under TSCA. Uh, and that means that EPA's got the burden of proof for establishing that a chemical presents an unreasonable risk. Um, and that presents opportunities for judicial review at the far end of the process. Next slide. Uh, REACH has uh, a provision calling for SBHCs, substances of very high concern. Those are pejorative terms. Um, TSCA, um, identifies chemicals, uh, typically high priority chemicals, as chemicals that may present an unreasonable risk. I anticipate that the blacklist effect of EPA's prioritization is probably going to be less than the uh, corresponding blacklist implications of SVHCs. Uh, EPA uh, REACH under REACH, ECA authorizes either through authorizations limited allowances for use of chemicals or restrictions, which are pretty much bans. Uh, under TSCA, EPA has a wide range of available remedies. And under judicial review, uh, appeal is potentially uh, possible to the European Court of Justice, which has proven very hostile to challenges to um, ECA actions under REACH. Uh, under TSCA, EPA's got uh, a lot of challenges uh, itself. It has to justify its actions based on substantial evidence on the record, which the legislative history shows requires searching um, uh, evidence. Next slide. So in summary, uh, for TSCA, uh, it's a new world. Uh, the, there's been uh, a step change, a sea change, however you want to call it. Uh, it's not the way it was before. Uh, you may not have felt it yet because the process is still building up. It's still, it's gonna take a few years to fully get implemented, but it has begun and it's going to continue. Uh, bottom line, EPA has a lot more authority and it plans to exercise that authority. But in the structure uh, that's been laid out by the revised statute, there are a lot of opportunities for stakeholder involvement and strategically it makes sense for stakeholders, companies such as yours, to look critically at their vulnerabilities for their chemicals of interest and take steps early and often uh, and throughout the regulatory process to try and um, impact EPA's ultimate decisions. Next slide. So at this point, uh, we've reached the end of the regular presentation and I would be happy to entertain your questions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, it looks like we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, just a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Uh, we already have several questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can before the top of the hour. Um, uh, first question comes from Amy and she asks, will a low volume exemption submission be more likely to get approved quicker than a full PMN under the new process? Yes, uh, it will. The uh, low volume exemption application requ regulation did not get amended and there's no change in the statute that would particularly affect it. Um, uh, EPA under that regulation has a 30 day review period. So uh, LVEs are still a good uh, opportunity uh, as an alternative to, EP to a full PMN but 
I do expect greater scrutiny by EPA. And so there will likely be few, uh, fewer LVE applications actually approved. Okay. Uh, Dina asked um, a question about the effects of the new administration on rulemaking uh, related to TASCA. So the, um, that's a great question. Uh, we, uh, all the proposed rules that have come out so far were proposed by the Obama administration. Uh, we'll get some insight into changes um, in philosophy and approach by the Trump administration once the final rules come out, the three framework rules plus uh, the first three um, uh, Section 6 uh, risk management rules, uh, because a number of changes were suggested by stakeholders. Uh, in general, uh, the administration has been pushing and folks in Congress have been pushing uh, legislative changes to the Administrative Procedure Act uh, and other provisions that would uh, considerably slow down uh, the administrative process of rulemaking. And if implemented, they could, across the board, affect federal rulemaking, and that would affect TOSCA rulemaking as well. In general, however, because there are time deadlines for some of the key uh, rulemakings, uh, the uh, likelihood is that the Trump administration will not have uh, much impact on whether EPA promulgates these rules. Instead, it is more likely to impact the decisions that EPA makes in the co in the context of those rules. Okay, thanks, uh, Mark. Mm -hmm. The next question comes from Chuck, and he asks he's asking about whether there have been any changes to the FIFRA and FFDCA covered exemptions. Uh, and he has an example. Are drug starting materials and intermediates still exempt, even though pesticide and other intermediates are covered? Uh, no changes at all, exactly the way it was before enactment. And uh, what he described about intermediates under FFDCA being exempt, uh, but not under FIFRA, uh, that's still the case. Okay. Uh, next question comes from John. Uh, he asks, can you provide thoughts on how long it will take the EPA to move something from the inactive to the active list after the reset? Uh, the expectation is that it would move pretty quickly, I would say, you know, within a short period of time. EPA deems a chemical to be added to the inventory once it receives a notice of commencement, even though uh, it may not do the paperwork to actually add a chemical to the inventory until some time after that date. I would anticipate that the same sort of process would be involved here. If EPA receives a notice that an inactive chemical is to be moved to the active substances list, it will be deemed to be um, an active substance as of the date of receipt of that notification. Um, but we'll have to see for sure once the final rule comes out. Okay, and uh, John also asked if whether it's anticipated that EPA will meet the June 22nd, 2017 date for the final rule related to the reset. EPA is going to try. Uh, I'm skeptical that they're actually going to meet June 17th, as it does take so long for EPA to do rulemaking, even under um, the current circumstances. Um, we'll see. Uh, that's certainly their target. Uh, Julie asked whether you could address how the changes in confidential business information impact the required revisions to the CDR reports submitted after June 22nd, 2017. Well, that's a good question. There, there is some guidance available from EPA about that in the FAQs. I don't have that guidance right in front of me, um, but I would refer you to that. Okay, uh, next question, how is the EPA addressing proposed significant new use rules as part of the new TOSCA? There is a statutory change that requires EPA to consider issuing a significant new use rule within, I believe it's six months after a chemical is added to the um, TOSCA inventory. Uh, 
EPA has been trying to meet a approximately six-month rule itself voluntarily prior to enactment. Now it's got a statutory mandate to, to do that. Um, it doesn't have to issue a significant new use rule, but it's likely that it will. Um, so if EPA issues a uh, 5B order, I think it's highly likely that EPA will issue a SNR within approximately six months, probably as a direct final rule. Uh, that's the preferred method. Uh, it it's, uh, saves administrative resources for EPA. Um, and that's what we've mostly seen coming out of EPA uh, since enactment. There have been some direct final snurs that have been um, issued. Okay. Um, uh, next question is, do you have a time estimate of when the TSCA reset process will be announced? Uh, the final inventory reset rule uh, is due by June 22nd of this year. Uh, I anticipate that there, uh, the final rule will be published around that time, uh, certainly within a month of that time, I would expect. Uh, following that, however, there will be, there will need to be guidance documents, instructions for reporting, uh, reporting mechanisms set up that will uh, take a, a bit of time. The reports are due six months after the final rule, so by December or so, it might slop into January, um, for manufacturers, uh, processors would have uh, an additional six months. That's according to the um, proposed rule. Uh, things could change in the final rule. Okay. Uh, Larry asks, could you briefly highlight the implications and vulnerabilities to chemical supply chain? Uh, certainly. Uh, downstream uh, formulators and uh, chemical manufacturers uh, require uh, critical chemicals for their products to be received from their suppliers. Uh, those uh, suppliers may be directly impacted by uh, chemical restrictions imposed by EPA, either under Section 5 uh, for PMN chemicals and SNRs, or under Section 6 uh, for existing chemicals. So the, um, an EPA chemical-specific uh, activity will, as a very strong likelihood of rippling throughout the supply chain. Um, in addition, there are going to be requirements uh, where companies are going to have to report based on information, uh, about, report with respect to chemicals that they receive from their customers, and they may not have full information about that. Um, for example, under the chemical data reporting rule already, uh, if you uh, import chemicals, you have to report some information about those chemicals, such as the identity, and you may not know that identity. Um, uh, and so you're, uh, it's increasingly important to get information um, from your upstream suppliers in order to comply with TSCA and other requirements. Okay. Uh, a couple of people are asking about the polymer exemption. Um, does it still exist, and are there any changes to it? It still exists, and there are no changes to it. Okay. Um, a question from Dimitri. He asks, will the same Tosca exemptions apply to pharmaceuticals and cosmetics? Yes, no changes. Okay. Um, Eric asks, is the iris matrix going to be part of the expediting of chemical type? Uh, iris is EPA's um, process for evaluating the hazards of chemicals. Uh, it's a process that has come under intense scrutiny. EPA has also made intense efforts to rehabilitate it. Uh, EPA indicated in the proposed rules on prioritization and risk evaluation that it intended to rely on IRIS evaluations for the hazard aspects 
of um, uh, its evaluation of chemicals. Uh, so iris is going to be quite important. Uh, iris should not be the end of the uh, road for hazard issues addressed by hazard by iris evaluations. However, I think there's plenty of opportunity for providing additional information not considered by iris, uh, by critiquing iris assessments, and uh, by uh, addressing exposure. IRIS is hazard only. EPA regulates on the basis of risk, which also considers exposure. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for addressing risk through the exposure side, uh, in addition to whatever EPA came up with under IRIS. Okay. Um, and Pat asks, did EPA's proposed risk evaluation give insights into what data companies could usefully provide EPA for its evaluation. Could you say that one more time? Sure, Mark. Uh, the question is, did EPA's proposed risk evaluation uh, provide any insights into what data companies could usefully provide EPA for its evaluation? Uh, not specifically, because it really is a generic kind of rule. But I, I would encourage companies to um, uh, look at available information about the chemical. And, and for instance, is this chemical fall into one of EPA's chemical categories of concern? Uh, if so, for instance, is it an epoxide? Uh, if it's an epoxide, look at EPA's uh, chemicals of concern document that identifies the kinds of concerns EPA has about epoxides. Um, and develop data, uh, consider developing data, that address those concerns. Uh, if EPA is likely to think that your chemical might be a PBT, then develop data suggesting, uh, supporting the conclusion that it's not a PBT. Um, if the concern is with uh, uh, potential uh, aquatic toxicity, then develop data on aquatic toxicity so that you have something to refute EPA's models. Okay, Mark, uh, we've pretty much reached the top of the hour. Um, and I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions today, but Mark uh, was generous uh, enough to provide his email address in the um, chat section. So if you have any other questions, I'm sure you'd be happy to, to uh, respond. Um, I'd like to thank all of our attendees today for um, joining us, um, and thanks to Mark Duval and Michael Duell for their presentation, and to Dassault Systems Biovia for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, please be on the lookout for announcements of uh, future Synergist webinars.